Hello, Miss Evans class. How are you guys doing this afternoon? You guys can give me a big thumbs up if you guys are having a great day at school. Awesome, because we are having a great day here out at the beach at Galveston Island State Park. So my name is Ranger Taylor, and then I also have Ranger Lisa here with me today. And then kind of on the back side of our equipment is our kind of communication uh, team, and that is Ranger John. Ranger John will give a wave in the camera, good deal. Uh, from Huntsville State Park. He's helping us out with all of the um, camera-ing today. And then we also have Ranger Brenna, who is also here from Galveston Island State Park. She will be narrating some of our excitement today when Ranger Lisa and I are out in the water and the wind and the waves where it's too crazy and you guys may not be able to hear us. Um, but we are so excited that you guys have joined us today here. And we are at Galveston Island State Park here in Galveston, Texas. So if you guys haven't been to Galveston Island before, I wanna show you guys on the map exactly where we are. We are down here right at the edge of the Gulf of Mexico and we are on a barrier island called Galveston Island. So water surrounds our entire island all the time. So right now where we are at is actually the beach side. So we've got the Gulf of Mexico, the wind and the waves roaring right on top of us. And then on the back side of the island or the side that's closest to the mainland um, is where our bay system is. So things are a little calmer on that side, not so windy, not so wavy, but still very cool. Lots of life, lots of different life, lots of different animals, lots of different plants than what are on what is on this side of the beach side. Um, so I will turn it over to Ranger Lisa. She's got some cool things to share with you guys. Thank you, Taylor. Hey, everybody. So we um, we are on a barrier island, and I don't know if you've ever been to the beach before. Um, but I know maybe some of you have, and maybe you've been out to Galveston, but you should know that even up there in your classroom and in your neighborhoods and in your communities, what you do to the land up there impacts what we see and what the animals, the health and quality of the environment that's out here actually. And it's because you are up river from where we are. So you live close to the Trinity River, which is a big river that runs through Texas and it goes past the Dallas and Fort Worth area and goes all the way out to the estuary of the bay side, Galveston Bay, and then it comes around the island and that river water, that fresh water that comes down the Trinity River is going to come out to the Gulf of Mexico and it mixes with um, all the stuff that's out here. So if I were to go to the Trinity River there at Dallas and Fort Worth, and I were to take my finger and drop it into the river and put that bop on my tongue, like there's gonna be dirt, there's gonna be leaves or sticks or whatever, but the water that I taste is gonna be fresh. But if I were to drop my finger into this water, oh, okay, that tasted, well, do you know what it tastes like? Because this isn't fresh water. I got this water from the Gulf of Mexico, so it's completely different water. This is salt water. And if you've ever been to the beach and you've gotten that water like in your mouth or if you've gotten it like up your nose and it burns, and then you realize really quick you are not in a freshwater environment anymore. So all those lakes, streams, bayous, and creeks are going to flow down river. And we are at the lowest elevation, like we are at zero foot elevation. And so all the water is going to drain down this way and it brings all of the water, anything that's on the land. And that's what a watershed is. A watershed, which you are a part of the Galveston Bay watershed, because any of the land area that all drains to one water body, so Arlington, Dallas, and Fort Worth draining into the Trinity River, all of that's going to come down to this one water body, Galveston Bay and impact us. So anything that you put onto the land is gonna come on downstream. And we may be finding things today that may have floated past your neighborhood maybe a couple of months ago. So our goal for today is not actually to find evidence of what, what is happening upstream, but 
we're hoping to find out how some of the animals live in what is a pretty harsh environment. So up there in Arlington, you might be thinking, oh, it's a day at the beach. It's going to be so relaxing. We're going to like put up the hammocks and take a nap and get some sun and go swimming. And yes, you can do all of those things. And I don't know if you're hearing this, but it is really, really rough out here today. Like we've got 20, 21 mile per hour winds sustained. And if you're looking down the beach and you're seeing any waves, like all of that is just energy coming straight off of the Gulf of Mexico. And the first place that it hits is here on these barrier islands. And the, the purpose of an, a barrier island is to be a barrier for the mainland against any energy that's coming off the Gulf of Mexico. So the next like storm or hurricane that comes through, it's gonna hit this island first before it travels up and onto the mainland. And this harsh environment that's out here, like we come out and we visit, you may be out here for a day and, and you know, you kind of get pushed around by the waves and you get all of this great little breeze, but most of us, we can't live out here because it is such a high energy place. Not only is there like all of this wind and all of these waves, it's very loud out here, but the sand that is underneath this canopy, underneath my feet right now behind me, like it's not gonna be there for more than a few minutes. Like if I built a giant sand castle, it's probably gonna stay there for like a day and then it's gonna get pushed around. So the sand and everything here is always shifting. This is a very dynamic, high energy, constantly changing environment. But this is a home or a habitat for many different marine species. And those are animals that live in the saltwater environment. So behind me, you're seeing what is typically a beach. So we've got the ocean rushing up onto shore. You've got that wet sand area. It looks a little bit darker. It looks slimy or shiny. And then you get this tide line where or a raft line where all of the stuff in the ocean on the shore has been pushed up and dropped because that's the highest that the water got. And we're actually stationed here in the lighter sand. This is the dry beach. And then just on this side where you see vegetation, that's the beginning of the dune ecosystem, which again is also super important. All of this is the home for many animals. So you, we've got the dining room for the rattlesnakes over there in the dunes. You've got the living room for the pelicans to kind of chill and hang out over here and get entertainment that way. Maybe that's the kitchen for the sharks out there and the backyard for our sea turtles that use this place. So this is a home for many different types of animals, and we're going to use a variety of different tools in order to figure out what's going on around us. And over the long term, as we do this sampling over or like a survey over and over again, we sort of come to understand who is living here or if they're just passing through and how they survive in this really harsh place. So I think what I'd like to do is... Um, I did want to say that we're going to be using a, a seine net. That's one of the tools that we're going to pull out and you're going to get a chance to see us use it. Um, but a seine net is a really, really good, good tool for us. Um, I think, Taylor, if, if you're ready and Brenna, if you wouldn't mind so much, I'm going, to, I'm going to hand this microphone over to Brenna and then that way Taylor and I can get some of these nets out and, and try to use them in the water. So let's see if we can catch some stuff. Hey, good afternoon, everybody. Okay. So Taylor and Lisa are gonna show us how to use uh, this equipment in order to study the life out at the water's edge here. We have a couple of different things. I think we're gonna go from smallest to largest. We round up the equipment. As we're walking out here, you can actually see how we go from kind of the dry sand across the rack line and out onto the wet sand. The dry sand's good for all those high energy activities that you like to do at the beach, running around, you know, mate and uh, playing volleyball. The rack line's good for hunting shells. And right here is actually a great spot for the more relaxing activities of the beach, such as walking in the waves, letting them letting it splash over your feet. Do a little shell hunting here, but it's a little harder to find when the water comes in. Okay, so Lisa's got the dip net. Now, a lot of you might have a dip net similar to this for your fish tank if you keep, if you keep aquariums or fish as pets. 
And it works pretty much the exact same. You dip down to the water and try to catch your animals or, well, she's got a different tactic. You can also use it more or less like a butterfly net if any of you have ever tried to catch butterflies, except you hold it down instead of up. Is that oh, looks like she's got something. She's really excited about some of them. Oh my goodness. Oh. Now you want to make sure that you grab these uh, fish out of the net as soon as possible because uh, they do not have lungs. They need the water to breathe. So we have to get them out very quickly. And you want to touch them with wet hands only so they stay good and moist. And tiny one there. Okay, Steen, looks like we got a few shell fragments. Okay, we're gonna go again, Lisa? Okay, it looks like we got a couple of pavano. We have a little shell fragment there to play with. Now these fish stick to the shallow yellow waves. Oh, we got, a, got another good haul. Three more, same species. These are all juvenile pompano. Yeah. Yes, juvenile means that these are young ones. These are just kids. Ultimately, they'll grow to be about the size of a dinner plate. Uh-oh. I think one took a jump. So these are all the same species. They're a pretty common species in the water here. Okay, now Lisa is bringing out a little bit bigger gun, as it were. She's bringing out the push, the push net. And this, uh, they, she actually uh, put together herself with some uh, basic equipment that you can find just about any hardware store, PVC pipe and a net. She kind of pushes it around like a lawnmower and tries to use the waves uh, to her advantage, letting the incoming waves splash over it and then, and then using the outgoing waves. Okay. And you want to bring your equipment up out of the water when you Taylor, should you do that? Should hold them for it. Here, put this on your hip. Push against me. Hip. Yep. Yeah. See, and you can pick up a lot of. Wow. A lot of little guys here. Yeah. Nope. All right. I'm going to do it one more time. Oh. Oh, sorry, Brenna. No worries. Some people pay. And she's off again. Yeah, see how she faces it out into the waves. So if they're actually bring, uh, bringing in any animals in the current, the net will catch them. And then she turns around and comes back as the tide is going out so that anything that got washed up on shore as it's swimming back out, it'll hopefully also get caught in the net. It's a pretty effective trick. It means she doesn't have to work as hard to push it around because otherwise it's like pushing a lawnmower. Looks like we got, well, maybe you can tell me what that is. Oh, well, I was hoping that this was a fish scale or maybe a mermaid scale or a pretty piece of a clamshell, but no, this is actually a tiny piece of plastic. And if I can barely tell what that is, a lot of critters out here actually can't tell what that is either. They might mistake it for food and try to eat it. So we are going to pocket this and throw it away later. All right, the saying that these are the big guns. Now this one's a lot more difficult to use. As you can see as they unravel it, it is a very long neck. And to make it easier to drag through the water, it's got the floats on top, which keeps that end of the net on the surface and weights at the bottom, which keeps that side of the net on the bottom, you know, right at the sand level. Oh, 
Now this actually takes a lot of effort because you have to pull against the incoming waves. And you have to keep it angled right in the, in the water because otherwise if you lay it too flat, all the water just runs over the top and the animals go right out the other side. You have it too straight up and down, it tends to come out of the water and you and everything either swims underneath it or if it's below the water over the top. So they're gonna get a bit of a workout. Pull team, pull! It does take a little effort with your partner. This does require two people to operate. So you definitely wanna bring a buddy on this one. Oh, it looks like we got a lot. Now we got to bring it up above the water. Whoa. Again, let fingertips. Check your in. We got these. Yeah, they're in. Okay. They like you. Yeah, Lisa seems to have a magnetism when it comes to fish. <sighs> Okay, so we have two of these now. They all seem to be the same pomino species. Not seeing any, anything that looks different. Oh, wait, there might be a, yeah, there's a few uh, different species in there. Yep. Unfortunately, I'm, uh, the other species, it's, uh, too little for me to identify. We'll have to let the experts do it when we get back to the table. Okay, so we're going now one more time. Now the waves make it very difficult to draw that through the water, but it does help push things towards the net. It does actually uh, contrast to sailing on the base side with the calmer waters on the base side. You have to actually physically do all the dragging and uh, kicking up the water yourself. Okay, and they're coming in. I think I can see some little glints. And we're in, and we're off. Picking up another piece of plastic as we go. and another piece of seagrass. This actually came from the base side of the park, drifted all the way out here. There, this is seagrass. This is actually a very important resource for the base system because it provides food for a lot of animals, including sea turtles. And it's also a, bio, a very important habitat for young fish that will eventually make their way out into the open ocean. A lot of ocean fish that we like to catch and eat and that the fishing boats really go for begin their lives in the bay system where it's a little bit calmer and they can hide from predators more effectively and grow to be a good size before heading out to the open ocean. Got it? Okay, let's make our way back to the table. And we'll see if uh, Ranger Lisa can help us identify some of those other fish in addition to the pompanos. Okay, let me transfer you all back to Ranger Lisa and she'll tell you about our catch. 
right, team. I don't know if you could tell, but we lost our fuzzy mic. Fuzzy mic back on. Sorry, Ranger Don. So I don't know if you could tell, but man, Taylor and I, we are working hard for you guys. Ooh, that was rough out there. I am like, I am glistening. <laughs> it's hardcore. Fuzzy mic. All right, you guys let me know if the fuzzy mic goes away. Oh, we've got a temporary fix that Mr. John's gonna help us out with here in a little bit. Uh, <laughs> Yay, maintenance on the fly. I love it. Thank you. Adaptation. Adaptation. We adapt, improvise, overcome on this one. Same as our marine animals. So let's talk about what we just picked up out of that awesome net. So we use several different types of nets. Now inside of here, it's hard to tell, but I'm looking at probably around a dozen, maybe 15 individuals, but they are almost all the same species. Some of these are really young. So I'm gonna drop my elbows down. Maybe it'll stay a little bit steadier. So the big guy that's in here is similar to most of the other ones. And these are all juvenile pompano. Although I think some of these smaller ones might be menhaden. So I'm not, or maybe a shad. So these are all different species. Unfortunately though, as these fish are very young, I'm gonna put these guys, as these guys grow up, they may change. So I'm gonna put this into our bigger aquarium. And my ladies, nobody's talking to me yet, but I imagine they probably are feeling the wind and if we can put it back on, I bet you that would help. Maintenance on the fly, black skimmer. Sorry, I get distracted by birds. We've got the shore birds called the black skimmer. I've been like distracting all the rangers with all the animals. I'm like, oh, look, there's a bird. Oh, look, there's another bird. Sorry. So if I see like black skimmers, just another bird. I'm like, oh, it's a bird. My bad, y'all. I get distracted so easily. So we got the pompano, potentially shad, potentially menhaden, mostly all the same, similar species. And let's show that body shape off one more time. This is our, our second aquarium. Man, these guys are super active. And that's because of their body shape. In here, on average, I'm getting, and they're not sitting still for me to actually count, but I'm looking around 15, maybe potentially 20 individual animals, probably all of a similar species, but they all have a very similar body shape, which is called fusel form. So it's kind of compressed laterally, kind of flat. And what that does, especially at the peduncle, which is the, I know it's a crazy word, the peduncle is a special word for where the tail, the caudal fin meets up with the body. And here on these species, that broader body, which is kind of compressed laterally, has this tiny peduncle, that small place where the tail meets up with the body. And that's telling me that these guys are very fast and very agile. And so what they're doing is what they should be doing out in nature, which is like speed racing through. They're either trying to get something to eat or they're trying to get out of the way of being eaten, which is why holding them in this tiny little aquarium is almost torturous. It'd be like putting a cheetah inside of your closet. Like that's not probably the best place for them. So really cool animals. And you'll see that body shape a lot, especially in offshore fish because their, their main job is to just be fast and to just go, you know, cause it's a big open ocean. I'm gonna set this guy down. Let's see what else we've caught. So we had about 15 species in the first tub. We had about 20 in the second one. This one's got maybe, I wanna say seven, nine individuals. They're all looking again, very similar. So for a scientist doing a survey, they would look at the number of individual species, but then also they'd be looking at um, the number of individuals. 
see what's the diversity of species, but then also what's the abundance of animals that are here. So it looks like our species probably gonna be pretty similar. So I'm not getting a whole lot of variety or diversity, biodiversity out of our catch today, but it's hammering home that these pompano, these shad, these menhaden, they're so small, right? These are all juveniles, like teenagers, preteens. So these small individuals, while they are very good swimmers, and you can see them moving in this tank all around us, they're having a hard time swimming against the currents and against the waves. So today would probably be what we call a red flag day, meaning that like, even if you were a lifeguard, if you were an Olympic swimmer, you really need to be cautious out here and probably wear something like this, like a life jacket. Even if you know how to like, ah, I'm totally a surfer, like ah, I know how to handle this, well, that's great. But even on a rough day like today, everybody can have a hard time swimming, even the fish that make this their home. So they're gonna be swimming around in this thing and we've got this aerator going, which provides oxygen into the water and basically serves as a mechanical means of what the ocean is doing, which is stirring up the ocean right here at the wave shoreline. So these fish are getting a lot of oxygen in there. And we found some other things before we went out on uh, with the nets earlier. And so this right here is uh, what we call sargasm. It's a brown floating algae, so it's a plant. And you can see it's got the leaves that are there, right? And then I don't know if you know what dipping dots are. They were like a huge hit, maybe like a decade ago, and I think they still have them. But like, I see these like little bitty dipping dots, like these little bitty, they look like tiny little balloons connected to the, the main trunk or the stems of this ground floating algae, the sargasm. And so this plant does need a photosynthesize, which is why it has the leaves. And when it goes into the water, the farther down it goes into the water column, the harder it is for it to get the sunlight. So it's harder to photosynthesize or make its own food. So those little dipping dots, those are floating bladders, like a tiny little beach ball connected to the plant in order to keep it up towards the surface. And when they're out in the ocean, this sargasm creates a floating underwater ecosystem, essentially like a forest has been turned upside down and inside the water. And it provides a very critical habitat for a variety of species. As a matter of fact, there are four animals that you will find in no other place on the earth besides in the seaweed or in the sargasm. So, the species that you would find floating in the sargasm are the sargasm shrimp, the sargasm fish, you got it, the sargasm crab, and I don't know if you can read that, that second word, but this is a sargasm nuda branch, which is just kind of like a sea slug, all right? All of these animals float and live within that seaweed, but you can see in this picture, they're not the only animals that utilize this home. So there's a lot of fish that eat those fish that are out there. And not only are there fish, but you'll also find some really cool reptiles. So we do have these endangered species. And there are five species of sea turtles that all swim out in the Gulf of Mexico. And when they're born, they're about the size of an Oreo. So it, it would fit into the palm of my hand any of these sea turtles that we see out there. And these sea turtles, once they hit that open ocean, like they are a prey for a lot of different animals. But because I know that they need oxygen in order to breathe, what they'll do is they use this like a floating raft. My baby sea turtles will go and curl up inside of that seaweed. So all they have to do is lift their head up to breathe because they don't have gills, they have lungs like we do. And so they use this sargasm not only to protect them from birds or animals coming like sharks and other things coming up from underneath, but then they'll eat the animals like the shrimp, the fish and the crab that live in there. And then they use it as a giant floating raft. So this is a really important critical habitat, not just for those animals that we don't find in other places in the world, but also for our endangered Kemp's Ridley sea turtles. 
So we um, had found some of the seaweed and I put it in there so that my fish can kind of feel like they're in a good ecosystem. They can find that protection if they need it. But we also found some things as we were walking along the shoreline, sorry, three black skimmers. I'm, I'm so distracted by those birds. Super cool birds. They have adapted a longer lower mandible, which is so the, their bottom chin on their beak is longer than the top. So when their beak comes together, it doesn't, it doesn't meet up. It actually is like this. And what they do is they're gonna skim the surface for any small fish, shrimp and crabs. And when they feel it in there, they close it up. So they skim right there along the surface. So I'm sorry, we're like really distracted. I'm like, oh, it's black skimmers, sorry. But that's another really cool adaptation that we find here on the shoreline, specifically as a feeding behavior. And we found another really cool, interesting feeding behavior um, out of this animal. Well, I say animal. This is actually a colony of animals. And you're probably looking in the stub, you're like, oh, Ranger Lisa, I know what that is. That's a jellyfish. I'm gonna be like, well, you're kind of close. That's pretty close. This animal is actually a, a Portuguese man of war. And instead of being one animal, like I would find in a jellyfish, this is actually four separate organisms that all live together in a colony. It's kind of like a neighborhood or a community of organisms that work together in order to survive. So the first animal is the bladder or the sail or the top floating portion of our Portuguese man of war. So that's one organism. Another organism is found in here. It's a reproductive organs. There's another organism that it's down right in here and that's the digestive organ organism so it breaks things down and feeds the other organisms and then you have these those long stinging tentacles that are down there and i don't want to get too close to this guy or gal this individual animal this portuguese man of war these this colony that's there has already claimed one victim so there is one of our baby pompano they got a little too close to the stinging organism found in the Portuguese man of war, and now it is no longer with us, all right? But there are a lot of things that are gonna eat that. So it's not, it's not like a not going to waste, all right? It's not a tragedy. But this organism right here, even when it washes up on the beach, even if one of those four organisms that are in there, if they pass away, the Portuguese man of war can still continue to live. So. We found this one washed up on shore and I was telling Ranger Brenna, Ranger John, Ranger Taylor, I was like, well, don't even touch it because even if it's up on shore, it's not dead and it will still continue to sting you. And we've been touching things that touch the Portuguese man of war. And I feel like I've, I've gotten stinging cells or nematocysts on my hands. So if you're really sensitive, um, I always make the distinction between jellyfish and these Portuguese man of war, which again are different species. The jellyfish, if I get stung by a jellyfish, like, yeah, it hurts, it's irritating, I get a little rash, I get the bumps, but I can pour some vinegar, spray some vinegar mix on there, or put some meat tenderizer on it, and all of those things help to take out the sting. But for a Portuguese man of war sting, the only thing that's actually going to make it go away is some of the salt water that we find out here. So knowing the organism is going to help us adapt to coming out and visiting the beach. So we've got this organism that's in here. And then I found another one that I put in here. Can you guys see it yet? Can, can you see the, can you see the animal in there? You guys can't see that animal in there? Well, huh, let me see if I can, hey, are you in there? Oh my goodness, don't tell me that it escaped. So I'm, oh, I found it. Whenever you walk along the shoreline and you dig into the sand, as I often like to do, uh oh, it's moving away from me. This animal is often found in the sand. Uh oh, can somebody help me find the animal? I don't even know where it is. Oh, is he? Yeah, it's a slippery little, little guy. There it is. Here, let me rinse it off. So this right here 
is called a coquina clam. And this coquina clam is a type of animal known as a bivalve. So that means that it has two halves and you can see that hinge that's right there at the back of this bivalve. So these coquina clams have come in a variety of colors. They can come from pink, yellow, coral color, even this dark blue that's there. And their adaptation is to live along the shoreline and to feed off of things that wash up onto the shore. So its job is to actually stay in, what did you guys just see that? Oh my goodness. And now the clam is gone, except I see that there's two tubes that are coming out of the bottom of that sand right there. So those are the valves for our coquina clam. And what it's doing is it's sucking in the water around it, and then it's gonna filter that water out and then eat any microorganisms. So phytoplankton or zooplankton, small, tiny microscopic organisms that are floating around in the water. So this would be like, instead of you going to the Chinese buffet, imagine sitting on your couch and the Chinese buffet comes to you, all right? So that's the strategy for this coquina clam right here. And that process where they dig down into the sand like that is called fixotrophy, where they add a little bit of movement to a gelatin state and it liquefies underneath them. And you've experienced that if you've ever gone to the beach and like shuffled your feet back and forth, that's fixotrophy as your feet sink down in the sand. So really cool process that we see out here. And we have an animal that uses a special adaptation in order to filter feed through the shoreline here. But that's part of what some of these animals out here are looking for. So we were talking about the shorebirds, right? These shorebirds, and you'll see them as they go, as the waves go out, shorebirds go out. As the waves come up, the tide comes up, shorebirds are gonna come up too. And they're using their beaks to probe down into the sand, just like I, like I had a hard time finding it. I knew exactly where it was and I had a hard time finding it. So these birds out here are actually probing into the sand to find coquina clams and then that's what they eat. So the deeper the beak or the longer the beak, the longer they can probe down into that soft sand to get different like invertebrates like this. We'll find a whole bunch of other animals that use that same process of digging right there at that shoreline. So let's see, we've talked about our fish and we've identified those. I'd say over the entire day, so we've done this survey three times with Ms. Evans class, and we probably have found around 65, maybe 75 individual animals just using those nets, like super easy, super fast. But as far as the species are concerned, the diversity, we're looking probably around five, maybe seven different types of animals. And then we get into the, the other animals like the coquina clam, or this colony, which again is like four animals. And so it starts to increase up quite a bit. And we not only find live animals, but sometimes we find uh, the parts of the animals after they have already gone away. So this right here is not seaweed. This is actually a bryozoa. It's an animal that looks like a plant. So it looks like seaweed but each individual branch on this branching bryozoa is a separate organism. So just like this Portuguese man of war, this is another colony of animals and they may or may not still be alive. So I'm gonna put them back into the water and if they get stung, that's not a big issue. But then we also find things like, oh, here we go. When people come out to the beach, like, yeah, they wanna go swimming. They wanna go catch some surf. They wanna go fishing. They wanna, you know, get a good suntan and take a nap out here in the waves or out in the, out in the shade. And then I get a lot of people who love to beach comb. And I don't know if you have like a collection of rocks or shells, but I love to collect shells. So I found this one. This one is an Eastern oyster. And the other half of this bivalve would have closed over the top. And if you or your parents like to eat raw oysters. This is one of the few animals we can eat raw. You just take a knife and you open it up because you can't use your hand. It's like so hard, it's like so muscular. And then you would slurp out what looks like a giant ball of snot in there. It, it doesn't sound appealing to me, but I love the shells. And the muscle, the abductor muscle where they hold the two halves together 
it, it makes a stain on the inside of these Eastern oysters. So you'll usually see that darker stain. That's where if they were gonna develop pearls, which these don't develop pearls, but if they were, that's where it would be. And so we have these bivalves, but we also have these shells that have a spiral on them. And these are gastropods. And there's a, a lot of different types of gastropods that are out here. And I found this one. This is probably an oyster drill. And this one I just found, like I, it was halfway buried. All I saw was this above the sand. And as I pulled it up, I noticed that the spiral on this one was different. So most gastropods open on this side. But your Texas State seashell, this gastropod called the lightning whelk, is the only one that I know of here in Texas that opens on the opposite side. So if you ever find a whole bunch of gastropods and one of them opens on this side, what they call the left hand side. So as you face it, your left hand would go into that hole right there. Then you just found the Texas state shell. These can get over 11 inches long. They're one of the biggest seashells that we have. And it's your Texas state seashell called the lightning well. So we got an oyster drill, we got a lightning well, and oh, one of our other carnivorous animals this is a fairly common shell gastropod known as a moon snail. And we actually found the murder scene from this carnivorous animal. So here is the murder scene. So this is a bivalve. This is called a, a blood arc or an arc shell. All right, so this is another type of bivalve, but do you notice that perfectly circular hole? I mean, it's, it's absolutely perfect. Now, Ranger Taylor, who works there, she didn't come out last night with a drill and drill a hole in here so I could put it on my necklace or my keychain or make Christmas ornaments out of it. Instead, what happened is the moon snail. So here's a picture of the moon snail outside of its shell, all right? So this tiny one that I have probably would have covered, I don't know, two or three different fingers. So the moon snail has a tongue. And this is what the tip of the tongue looks like microscopically. It's like a tiny little drill, right? And they call this tongue a radula. And if we even, if we zoomed in even larger on that radula, it has these little bitty rasps on it. And so, it takes its tongue and it puts its tongue onto the shell of this animal like that, Ugh. but they like it. And they put that tongue on there and that tongue starts to make a hole until eventually two, three hours later, you have this perfectly circular hole. And because this animal can't pry open the bivalve with its, you know, like giant little moon snailiness, it cuts that abductor muscle and then it slurps out the animal from the inside after injecting it with basically its spit. So these gastropods, super cool, but they are all carnivorous. So they all eat meat and they do it with that special eye tongue of theirs. And then we find their murder scenes with those perfectly circular holes. So super duper cool. Now we've been um, showing off some of the animals that we have found, but a lot of us are out here looking for some rare or endangered species. Like you might be out here like looking behind me for like shark fins or killer whales. Maybe there's a mermaid or a Loch Ness monster out there on the water. Like I, I have no idea what you're seeing behind me, but most of us and most of my volunteers are out here looking for a special reptile. And that's our Kemp's Ridley sea turtle that we talked about earlier. So we have the lightning welcome to your Texas state seashell. And this is your Texas state sea turtle. So this Kemp's Ridley has become adapted to living in the water as opposed to the sea turtle or the turtles that I see down the Trinity River around the ponds. All of those land-based turtles all have feet. So they got claws, they got feet, whereas these Flippers are adapted for sea turtles because they spend 99.9% .9 of their lives swimming in the ocean, but occasionally they're going to come up onto shore, which is what happened both yesterday and actually this morning as well. 
So my mother, Kempsterly sea turtle, she has 100 ping pong sized eggs in her belly and she crawled on her belly out of the ocean, which is weird because they don't have feet. And they use those flippers and she drug her heavy body about a hundred pounds worth onto the shore, dug a three foot hole with her very strong back flippers, deposited all of those eggs. And then she turned around, she was like, peace out. I'll see you guys later, bye babies. And she's gone back into the ocean. Well, some helpful humans, our sea turtle patrol spotted this endangered and very rare species nesting right here behind me, like literally right here behind me in these dunes. When they saw that, they decided to coordinate it off, call in the scientists, scientists came out, and now we're gonna be helping those baby sea turtles get back out into the ocean so that they can live full, happy, healthy lives. So my ladies and my gentlemen, I know we may have like one or two minutes left, but we've been talking quite a bit. And I, I, I know that we've been really focused in on how these animals adapt to this environment, but we also wanted to give you guys a special invitation to come out. Thank you, Ranger Lisa. So we know that you guys learned a lot of information about all of the animals that live here at Galveston Island State Park and that live here on the beach in this harsh environment and all of their adaptations that they gain or that they have to help them survive and live and thrive and even like the mama sea turtle be able to come up here and lay her eggs to have babies. So it's super awesome um, that you guys were here with us today, but we'd love to see you in person here at Galveston Island State Park. So maybe this summer with your family, if you guys come on down here, come to the beach, come visit the park. And even if you don't go to the beach, go to the Bayside and see what that's all about. See all the plants and animals that live on that side. Um, so we'd really like to invite you guys out here to Galveston Island State Park and life is better outside. So the more you spend outside, the better your life is gonna be. 